sing the second part that we just did. If you would normally sing something like soprano or tenor, uh, and if that doesn't mean anything to you, just pick. <laughs> All right. One, two, three, here we go. Alleluia. Yeah. <laughs> 
lesson is taken from Romans chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words, and God who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. For those who He for, for, for knew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not yet with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who was at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for you, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Another parable Jesus put before the crowds. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. And finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. And he comes to a well, and he 
and he's talking with the shepherds there who say, Laban's camp is, you know, to the northeast or wherever. And then a woman comes herding her father's sheep. And the shepherds say to Jacob, that's Rachel, Laban's daughter. And she comes to the well to get water for her sheep in the midday. Jacob is very taken with Rachel. And he moves the stone from over the well. Wells in the desert of the, at that period were hand dug in the sandstone to lay back to water. So they were always covered to protect them. So he moves this big stone so that Rachel can draw water for her sheep. And then she runs ahead and tells her father that their kinsman Jacob is on his way. And the father Laban comes out to meet Jacob. So that's where our story picks up the, the two meet, and we've heard what happens. Jacob and Laban, Laban welcomes Jacob as a kinsman, and then says, well, you don't have to work for nothing. I don't have to work for room and board. What, what can I get? And he asks, of course, for the hand of Rachel. He works seven, years for her hand. But then he is deceived. But he is faithful to his love for Rachel. And he works another seven years. This is a story of faithful love. And it is to remind us of God's faithful love for us. In Psalm 136, there's a beautiful refrain after each verse, for God's steadfast love endures forever. God's steadfast love endures forever. Which is, in a way, an image of that. Love endures. Real love. It's not a fruit of the whole fruits. <laughs> And so, in the letter to the Romans, that beautiful eighth chapter, which we know sadly often because it's read at funerals, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And even deception did not sway Jacob on his love for Rachel. No, always, no. In all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us, through God, through Jesus Christ. We are called to respond to this loving God no matter what. As the parable in today's gospel reminds us, the kingdom of God is worth all that we have. This is what I think is the hard set. That God's love is everlasting and endures no matter what. Because we live in a world full of contradictions, full of issues. The reality of God's love and faithfulness is there. What we need to do is allow that love to penetrate our minds and our hearts. In those moments when it seems absolutely and utterly impossible because of all the confusion and all the contradictions that we see around us. Not to be too heavily into the New York Times today, but if you look at the front page, it is just full of this kind of contradiction. And I haven't had time for coffee this morning. And I'm looking and I'm thinking, okay, the Tigers and the Euphrates are drying up. They're, they were the cradle of civilization. They were verdant, green spaces they are in deserts. Then we read about all of the coup in Africa and 
whatever else was going on. And then this crazy story about a frenzy in Italy. Now, they're, and they're experiencing terrible problems. But what's the frenzy about? A love story about the streaming something or the other, Netflix, I suppose, called Beyond the Sea. And it's about love among juvenile delinquent criminals who are detained in a co-ed facility. It's the strangest thing. <laughs> but there you have it, right underneath famine, drought, climate change. What's the frenzy about? Love. The world is full of contradictions. The maker of the theologian, Parker Palmer, reflected on this and he wrote, and I think this just goes to the heart of the matter. The very structure of the cross symbolizes these contradictions. Its arms reach left and right, up and down, signifying the way life holds us between the conflicting claims of person against person, the conflicting claims of life human and life divine, and yet the arms of the cross converge at the center, symbolizing the way in which God can act in our lives to overcome conflict, to unify the opposition, to contradict the contradictions. The cross calls us to recognize that reality as a, that reality as a cruciform shape. What shall separate us from God's love? Either height or depth. This love of God is crucified. And at the heart of the cross is where it is resolved in our own hearts. And someday, in the heart of the world, Jacob loved Rachel and was willing to work 14 years to be her husband. God loves us and works continually to remind us of this love, knocking on our consciousness even when we are feeling distant and detached. This is the stuff of our personal love stories with God. There are no catchy headlines for those love stories, but they are real. God is present to us as to Jacob in his seeking. And the contradictions, the deceits, and the waiting. No matter all of these things, Paul reminds us, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For well, I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Christ Jesus our Lord. What is the headline for your love story? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? We now stand as we are able to confess our faith in the words of the creed. We believe in the one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in the one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, right to white, 
be with you. Also here. Lift up your hearts and lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and good and joyful to give you thanks, our holy God, the source of life and fountain of mercy. You have filled us and all creation with your blessing and fed us with your constant love. You have redeemed us in Jesus Christ and knit us into one body, through your spirit to replenish us and call us to fullness of life. Therefore, joining with angels and archangels and with the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we sing. <laughs> Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you in your creation this bread and this wine. By, and by your Holy Spirit, may it be for us the body and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share in these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, 
that with you, with all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, and the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you the honor, glory, and praise forever and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And give us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. And therefore, let us eat the feast. Hallelujah. The gifts of God and the people of God take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on them in your hearts by faith and thanksgiving.